Hey, what's up, nerds? It's Shane, and today I'm joined by David. Say what up, dude. Yo, what's up, dude? Today we're going to be going through your $100 upgrade for the new Precon Blood Rites that's coming out in Nixlon. I'm very excited about this upgrade. But before we jump into any of your additions, let's just talk about the face commander and what you want to do with this deck. This deck is going to be helmed by Clavileño, first of the blast. He is one, a white, and a black. For a total of three mana, it is a legendary creature vampire cleric. It is a 2-2 and says, whenever you attack, target attacking vampire that isn't a demon becomes a demon in addition to its other types. It gains whenever this creature dies, draw a card and create a tapped 4-3 white and black vampire demon creature token with flying. Yeah, so overall, the game plan of the deck really is just going to be able to uh, play a ton of vampires, start swinging in, making them just get that extra value. Hopefully having some of them die off to become vampire demons, draw some cards, and then uh, maybe get a little bit of a boost. And then also super relevant here, they actually do keep that vampire subtype even after we get the uh, the demon portion of the card. So it is pretty nice. Uh, there's a lot of vampire strategies and synergies, obviously, with this deck. And uh, ultimately, our game plan here is just beat face and, uh, well, kill our opponents. I'm really excited about all these kindreds coming out from Magic. Vampires are always fun. Let's just jump into your additions, bud. So the first card that I wanted to throw in this is another legendary creature. I had a buddy of mine when I first started playing Magic and when we first started playing Commander that had this card as his commander, and I remember having a just miserable time playing against it. So I figured, here is an opportunity for me to play the card. I'm going to jump on it. And that is Anawan the Ruin Sage. This is 3 and 2 black for a legendary creature, Vampire Shaman. It is a 4-3 and says, at the beginning of your upkeep, each player sacrifices a non-vampire creature. The wonderful thing here being is because we are a vampire deck, and even in the case we do need to, uh, I guess, get rid of some stuff, we don't really care. Uh, this is just kind of continuous removal for all of our opponents. Yeah, I would say so. I don't, I don't believe you have a one non-vampire in this deck. Yeah, we do have a way to to make a couple of other tokens that are not vampires, but that's okay. They can, they can, we can deal with that later on. Yep. Oh, that's a terrifying addition. Up next, we have Captivating Vampire. This is one and two black for a total of three. It is a creature vampire. It is a two, two, and says other vampires you control get plus one, plus one. It also says that you can tap five untapped vampires you control to gain control of target creature. It becomes a vampire in addition to its other types. So we actually don't give back what we just stole. Dude, you're going to be using yours to like transfer my guys into vampire? That's mean. Yeah, dude, that's what vampires do. You know, they give a little bit of a kiss and then boom, you are one. Is that what it, they call it a kiss now? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's going to be super annoying to play with. And it's a vampire lord. It is a vampire lord. <laughs> we also have Preacher of the Schism. This is two and a black for a total of three mana. It's a creature vampire cleric. It is a 2-4 with death touch and says whenever it attacks the player with the most life or tied for the most life, you create a 1-1 one, one white vampire creature token with lifelink. And whenever it attacks while you have the most life or tied for the most life, you draw a card and lose one life. Yeah, this is from the new set. This is a really strong card if you're playing with vampires. I'm a big fan of this card, dude. I mean, that is that is our game plan. All right, well, those are some vampire creatures you're adding in. What about some other spells? Uh, we are going to be playing with white and black, which has some of the best removal for uh, spot removal in the game. So we've got to be throwing in Path to Exile here. This is a single white mana for an instant. Exile target creature. Its controller may search their library for a basic land card. Put that card onto the battlefield tapped and then shuffle. We also are going to be throwing in another removal piece. This one is fairly new, and this being Stroke of Midnight. For two and a white, a total of three mana, you get an instant that says destroy target non-land permanent. Its controller creates a 1-1 one, one white human creature token. Hey, I like this card. 1-1 one, one is smaller than a 3-3. 1-1 three, three. One, one is smaller than a 3-3. Three, three. In <laughs> fact, actually, a 1-1 one, is probably not going to be very contributive over the course of the game, so uh, I'm happy to give him 1-1. One, one. The last instant that I'm going to be throwing into this list is Deadly Dispute. This is one in a black for an instant. It says, as an additional cost to cast a spell, sacrifice an artifact or creature. It also says, draw two cards and create a treasure token. So this is really nice. It synergizes quite well with our commander. Um, if we do happen to have one of our vampires that has become a demon, we can always use this to uh, get rid of it, draw some cards, and then make that vampire demon 4-3 flyer. This is very, very synergistic with this deck. I love it. All right, we saw the spells. What about some more permanents, maybe in enchantments, maybe some artifacts? Yeah, so the first one here is going to be Whip of Erebos. This is two and two black for a legendary enchantment artifact. It says creatures you control have lifelink. It also has an ability where you can pay two and two black to tap it and return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. 
It gains haste. Exile it at the beginning of the next end step, and if it would leave the battlefield, exile it instead of putting it anywhere else. Activate this ability only any time that you could cast a sorcery. This card is really important for two reasons, the first of which being that all of our creatures have lifelink is a pretty powerful effect. The other thing here being, too, is that we are going to hopefully be killing off quite a bit of our own creatures, and Whip of Erebos allows us to be able to get them back into play to uh, go for round two on the beatdown. Recursion on vampires, dude, seems pretty good. And lifelink, yeah, that's going to going to be very fantastic for this deck. We uh, we don't like our opponents having creatures, so we want to continue with some enchantments that are going to help us out here. The first of which is Dictate of Erebos. This is three and two black for an enchantment with flash. It says whenever a creature you control dies, each opponent sacrifices a creature. Ugh. God, David. Yeah, you're mean. And if that wasn't enough, I'm also going to be throwing in Grave Pact. This is one and three black for a total of four mana for an enchantment, and it says whenever a creature you control dies, each opponent sacrifices a creature so wait a minute you're gonna be sacrificing your creatures on purpose and then making us uh yeah, yeah I guess that's the deck is going. yeah it's gonna be fantastic I, I mean ultimately i would love for you to have just no board and me to have a bunch of demons <laughs> yeah i'm sure that's gonna happen quite often i do want to make sure that we can get our vampires back so i'm gonna be throwing in a phyrexian reclamation here i love this card it's one of my favorite cards in all of magic actually it is a single black mana for an enchantment that has an ability where you can pay one and a black and to life, and return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So make sure we get all of our vampires back. Yeah, that's amazing. And this works great with your commander, dude. Keep playing those creatures. Keep making them into demons. This is fantastic. Do we have any more artifacts you want to show off? Yeah, we have just one more. Um, I actually do think that the artifact package already included in the pre-con for this deck is pretty solid, just straight out of the box. So there is one other additional artifact card, just this general ramp that I wanted to throw in here, and that being Felwar Stone. It is two mana for an artifact that you can tap to add one mana of any color that a land that opponent controls could produce. Now, of course, we only do make up two-fifths of the color pie, but generally speaking, more mana is always helpful, and there's a chance that at least one of our opponents would be playing either white or black. So Felwar Stone is a great card in this list. And what about any lands? Are you going to be touching the lands at all in this deck? We are 100% going to be fixing up the mana base. The mana base actually straight out of the box, I got to say, is not that bad. Uh, this is just a two-color deck, so, I mean, it's kind of difficult to goof that one up. But we're going to be improving it at least a little bit. The first card here that I want to bring up is Nykthos Shrine to Nyx. So this is a legendary land that you can tap to add one mana to your mana pool. Or you can pay two mana and tap it, choose a color, and add to your mana pool an amount of mana of that color equal to your devotion to that color. Um, this deck is 66% black. So there is a lot of black mana here. Nyctos, Shrine to Nyx, um, has a pretty good opportunity to just generate massive amounts of mana for us. Yeah, Nyctos can make so much mana, man. That can get out of hand very quickly. I'm also going to be throwing in Vault of Champions. This land says it enters the battlefield tapped unless you have two or more opponents and can tap for either a white or a black. Thank you so much, Wizards of the Coast, for reprinting this not too long ago. These cards are super staples in this format. And then I'm going to be throwing in the pain land here, Caves of Koilos. This is a land that can tap for a colorless, or it can tap for either a white or a black, but it'll deal one damage to you. Yeah, those bond lands are fantastic, man. And they're just so damn affordable right now. Yeah, it's great. You got to throw them into this list, especially with just how cheap they are right now. Uh, and then the last card we're going to be throwing into this pre-con just as a general upgrade is going to be Shattered Sanctum. This is a land that says it enters the battlefield tapped unless you control two or more other lands and you can tap it for either a white or a black. So not generally a whole lot that I'm touching on the mana base here. There are a couple of cards, just generally speaking, that I thought were good includes. Um, and you'll kind of just see the, the usual offenders that were in this deck that are going to be cutting as well as, as far as the mana base goes. Yeah, those all make sense. Those are very straightforward and great land upgrades. You walked us through all your awesome upgrades. We had to do the part now where you got to remove some cards. Why don't you talk us through some stuff you're going to be cutting and maybe a little bit of reasoning for the people. Yeah. Uh, so the first card I'm going to be cutting is Order of Sacred Dusk. This is six, a white, and a black for a total of eight mana. It is a creature vampire knight. It is a 5-5, five, five, and although it is really expensive, it does have Convoke. For those of you who don't remember, Convoke says that your creatures can help cast a spell, and for each creature that you tap while casting the spell, it pays for one or one mana of that creature's color. This has Flying, Lifelink, and Haste, and Exalted, and it also says that other vampires you control have Exalted. So this does a lot. Uh, the reason why I'm going to be removing this card from the list, though, is just generally this is going to be still an 8-drop in my hand. 
Uh, there's no guarantee that I'm going to be able to reduce this enough to where I want to actually be able to get this thing in play. And although it is a decent body, it does potentially have a pretty low floor. It's just another card that's going to sit in my hand and not do anything. So I did decide, you know what? I want to cut this. Yeah, it's pretty damn expensive, man. Convoke, like you said, does not ensure that it's cheaper. And then we are going to be removing Timothar, Baron of Bats. This is 4 and 2 black for a total of 6 mana. It is a legendary creature, Vampire Noble. A 4-4 four, four with Ward of Discard a Card. And it also says whenever you have another non-token vampire you control dies, you may pay 1 and exile it. If you do create a 1-1 one, one black bat creature token with flying, it gains whenever the creature deals combat damage to a player, sacrifice it, and return the exiled card to the battlefield tapped. Um, I just kind of felt like this in a way, contradicted what our commander wants to do, where we want our things to go off and die. Um, I don't really want our things to just go off and, like, get exiled out, because I would love to be able to recur them, although, I don't know. This does have kind of a weird recursion aspect to it, too. Generally speaking, though, I mean, this is still a six drop, and uh, if you have watched any of our videos, you'll know how I feel about expensive cards. Yeah, I understand. Heavy card. Maybe not as impactful as some of the additions you added. Up next, I have Bloodline Necromancer. This is four and a blank for a creature vampire wizard. It is a 3-2 with lifelink, and it says whenever it enters the battlefield, you may return target vampire or wizard card from your graveyard to the battlefield. I actually do love this effect. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of the body, though. Five mana is kind of expensive to be able to get this kind of effect, even though we obviously are going to be able to uh, kind of two for one in terms of like the mana value here. So I do actually like this card. I just needed to make a little bit of room. So Bloodline Necromancer got the cut. Yeah, I mean, and you also added a lot of other ways to be recurring. So this kind of, this seems more like a budget recursion, whereas some of the stuff you added might have been a little bit, a little bit better. And then uh, Oats Sworn Vampire is also going to be getting the axe here. This is one in a black for a creature vampire knight. It is a 2 2 and says it enters the battlefield tapped. It also says you may cast it from your graveyard if you gain life this turn. Um, there are a an okay ish number of ways to gain life in this deck, but it's not super dedicated to gaining life. I just looked at it like there's actually other cards. Uh, there's there's other creature cards already included in this list that like to kind of just like bounce back and recur themselves. And although I do think that it is an important and impactful ability, I just think Oatsworn Vampire might not be consistent enough in the build as it currently is. Uh, so in the need to make room, it got the cut. Yeah, it just seems like a 2-2. And then the final creature that I'm going to be removing here is Champion of Dusk. This is 3 and 2 black for a creature vampire knight. It is a 4-4 four, four and says whenever it enters a battlefield, you draw X cards and you lose X life, where X is the number of vampires you control. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. What in the world is going on? Why is David removing this incredible draw spell? Here is the thing. I think that this is one of those cards that always reads so much better than what it actually plays. Because the only time I ever have the ability to cast this is whenever it is either the only creature that is in play, of which case I don't really want to just draw one card and lose one life. That's not all that great. Or if I happen to have like 15 other vampires in play, in which case this becomes terrifying. And yes, I do draw a pretty decent amount of cards. However, I completely nuke my life total if that is the case. Yeah, this never hits in that sweet spot. I would agree. So it, yeah. This can make sense. Yeah, I would love it if I could, like, consistently have this come in and hit me for, like, maybe three or four. That way it's a manageable amount and still be able to draw, but uh, it's just not going to quite do it for me. Also, even though we do have some recursion aspect in this deck, I'm not really wanting to throw a ton of cards into my graveyard due to uh, hand size. Yeah, that makes sense. We saw some new enchantments and some artifacts. Are there any you're going to be cutting to make room for it? Yeah, so the first one here is Promise of Aklazots. Uh, this is one in a black for an enchantment. It is an adventure, and the adventure portion of the card says Foul Rebirth. Uh, it is two in a black for a total of three. It is a sorcery, and it says sacrifice a non-demon creature. If you do, create a 4-3 white and black vampire demon creature token with flying. Uh, so that portion of the card basically does what our commander wants us to do. And then the other portion of the card says, at the beginning of your end step, you may sacrifice a non-demon creature if you do populate. So this effect is actually pretty solid in this list. I just needed to make some room, and I figured, you know what, I would kind of like to focus more so on limiting on our opponents in terms of what they can be doing with some of our uh, removal-based enchantments, rather than just kind of like feeding more so into our own deck. I just felt like this was a little bit more of like a win more card, rather than something that was actually going to push us over the edge. Yeah, I agree. Definitely feels like win more. And then you're just waiting for that board wipe. 
Um, I do have another enchantment that we're going to be removing here, and this is Kindred Boon. This is two and two white for an enchantment. It says, as it enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. You can pay one and a white to put a divinity counter on target creature you control of the chosen type, and each creature you control with a divinity counter on it has indestructible. Um, I don't actually care if our things die in this deck because we have recursion and we make demons whenever our things die. So the fact that they could potentially have indestructible doesn't really do a whole lot for me. And this card still is somewhat mana intensive. It is cool that I can use this to make sure that one of our like, I don't know, vampire demon flyers does gain indestructible. So it's a pain in the butt to deal with. But ultimately, I just once again needed to make room and didn't think that this was doing enough uh, at least in the lane that the deck wants to play in. Yeah, it seems a little, like, not vanilla, but just, it does, like, the one thing. Yeah, it, it makes sense. And then what about some artifacts? So I am going to be cutting Commander's Sphere here. This is three mana for the artifact that allows you to tap for one. And it has a tap, add one mana of any color to your Commander's Color Identity. You can sacrifice Commander's Fear, draw a card. Commander's Fear actually is not and has never been one of my favorite mana rocks out there. Um, we added in Felwar Stone. Felwar Stone is one mana cheaper, and although it doesn't quite do as much, um, I do think that these cards pretty much function almost identically like most of the time. Um, I would rather just take the two drop mana rock rather than the three drop mana rock, especially with our Commander coming in on turn three. Wayfarer's Bauble is the other artifact going to be getting the axe here. This is a single mana for an artifact that you can pay to tap it, sacrifice it, search your library for a basic land card, put it on the battlefield tap, and then shuffle. Wayfarer's Bauble, I think, is a really cool card. It is a uh, kind of like a, a budget go-to as far as, like, colorless ramp goes. Um, however, I don't actually think that we need a ton of ramp in this deck. A lot of our vampires are fairly cheap, um, and we do have a fairly decent number of artifacts that are going to be able to produce mana already included in the precon here, so... I'm not super worried about that. Yeah, two color decks don't really need too much. So I think it'd be good, dude. And what about any just other spells you're, cut you're cutting? Yeah, so the last card we're going to be removing from this list is Utter End. This is two, a white and a black for an instant that says Exile, target non-land permanent. Uh, this is a card that at one point in time was really good. However, I feel like just general power creep has kind of caught up with it. Uh, Stroke of Midnight, I do think, is just a better card. It functions a lot more efficiently. And although our opponent does get a creature off of Stroke of Midnight, coming in at only three mana and costing one color less is pretty impactful. Yeah, I would agree. Power Creep is real. We saw your land upgrades. What are the lands you're going to be cutting to make room for them? Yeah, so the first one here is Myriad Landscape. Uh, this is a land that always enters the battlefield tapped. Taps for a colorless whenever you don't need it. And then later on, you can pay two mana, tap it, sacrifice it, and search your library for up to two basic land cards that share a land type, put them onto the battlefield, tap, and then shuffle. I am not a fan of Myriad Landscape, if you couldn't pick up on that. This is just a very slow land. It's mana intensive on top of that. Uh, Myriad Landscape is a card that gets removed from almost every deck that I play. I think it's just everyone on the channel does this. <laughs> Orzov Basilica is the next card they're going to be removing here. It always enters the battlefield tapped. And it says whenever it enters the battlefield, return a land you control to its owner's hand. You can tap it for a white and a black. Uh, so at least that's kind of neat. But this is a weird card. It kind of costs you a little bit as far as like tempo goes because it does have to bounce that land back to your hand. Um, and with this also coming in tapped. Uh, these cards, generally speaking, I really only want to play with them if I am playing in a deck that actually is running something like Amulet of Vigor. That way they're coming in untapped. Or if I actually like care about bouncing lands back to my hand or potentially even discarding cards. We do have Recursion. I don't want to be relying on my Recursion to make up for whatever I had to discard for this due to hand size, though. Um, Orza Basilica and all of these Bounce Lands, they just play a little bit funky. I never want one in my opening hand. Yeah, these all really just feel like Precon Lands to me. Well, speaking of Precon Lands, we have kind of the king of the Precon Land up next, and this is Temple of the False God. This is a land that says, sit around, do nothing until you have five lands. Uh, it says, tap, add two colorless, activate only if you control five or more lands. Uh, this is like the king of do not be in my opening hand. Yeah. And it normally is always in our opening hand. Oh, if, if, if yeah, I was going to say, if this is in my deck, it will be in my opening seven 100% of the time. It just does that. Get it out of there. Shine Shadow Snarl is up next. This is a land that says, as it enters the battlefield, you may reveal a plains or swamp card from your hand if you don't it enters the battlefield tapped and it can tap for either a white or a black 
Um, this deck is running a grand total of 21 basics, which is actually a fairly decent number, but I did think that we included some better duels or some better cards that at least have the ability to tap for both colors of our mana. So uh, Shine Shadow Snarl, not a big fan of this card and did end up getting the axe. Yeah, I like the slow line you had over this line. And then uh, the final card we're going to be cutting from this deck is Windbrisk Heights. This is a land with Hideaway. If you don't remember what that does, it says this land enters the battlefield tapped, and whatever it does, look at the top four cards of your library. Exile one face down, then put the rest on the bottom of your library. You can tap for a white, or you can pay a white and tap it, and you may play the exiled card without paying its mana cost if you attacked with three or more creatures this turn. Um, this one is not the most challenging for you to be able to take advantage of that hideaway ability, but I do hate lands that enter the battlefield tapped, and I really have a difficult time in most games actually triggering the hideaway, or at least kind of like getting lucky enough to have that card be relevant. Yeah, I feel like this, these hideaway cards whiff a lot. And are those going to be all the cuts for the for the deck? Those are going to be all of the cuts for this deck. Right on. Well, we gave you a budget of $100. What did this upgrade come out to? So as of the time of this recording, this is coming up to $94. So we do have a little bit of extra budget in there. We'll see if some of the vampires that I've included have are going to fluctuate in price. Um, Generally speaking, these kinds of cards always do whenever new precons end up coming out. So um, at least right now, I'm under budget. We'll see if I stay that way in about two weeks. Hey, that's perfect. I love saving money, man. Are there any other final closing thoughts on the commander or the deck or anything you'd like to bestow? Yeah, uh, I mean, just kind of across the board, looking at the precon, I actually do really enjoy this. These are the kinds of precons that I love uh, wizards kind of pumping out. This is a deck that I think actually does function pretty well, just straight out of the box, even in the case that you don't want to put any upgrades into it. It has a very clear line as far as like what you probably should be doing. I mean, it's vampires, so throw more vampires into the deck, and it's probably going to work effectively. So <laughs> if you are a new player, this is a deck that I would recommend picking up. If you're a player that's been playing around for a while and you just like vampires, obviously run out there. Go grab this deck. There's a lot of really cool cards in it. And there's a couple new vampires in here as well that I can definitely see uh, becoming staples in the format as we move forward. Leave a comment for David letting him know what you think. Do you like his upgrade? Did he miss a card? We love growing and we love hearing from you guys. Also down there in the description, you'll find a link to the Moxfield. If you'd like to test out the deck, maybe goldfish it, maybe pick it up yourself. Link will be in the description. Also in the description, you'll find links to all of our socials. That is X, that is TikTok, that is Instagram. It'll be all at Guys at Magic. We also have a Patreon, so if you're trying to look to support us a little more, check out the link. Like this video if you like David's upgrade. Subscribe so you don't miss out on any upcoming content. We'll have 300s for this upgrade. We'll have, we'll have the other $100 upgrades. Tons of upgrade videos coming out. Don't forget. And until the next video, take it easy. Bye. Later now.